We're going to talk about Jeffrey Dahmer. He's also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or the Milwaukee Monster. He was a serial killer and he committed a bunch of murders and eight people back uh, between 1978 and 1991. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Well, I don't think there's a whole lot more to add to that with that grandiose <laughs> entry, other than he's talking to Stone Phillips, who I believe was at ABC at the time, and his father is there. His father's just written a book about his growing up and all of that, and he's talking about what he learned from the book in the process. It's an interesting one. He is might be one of Scott's favorite people. Maybe not. Let's see. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Sherry. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Mr. Phillips. Hi, Mr. Phillips. How are you? Nice to see you. Mm -hmm. Spending the last few days with your folks. Great. Talking about a lot of different things. Hey, you're lucky it came up on a day when there's no snow. It was snowing like crazy all weekend. Is that right? Yeah. How are things going here for you? Uh, slow and steady. Nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary, really. You've read the book? Yes. Yes, I read the book. Uh, uh, my dad sent it to me uh, about last week and uh, spent all night reading it. I was up all night reading it. It was uh, quite a surprise to me, some parts of it. In Very interesting. Sense? In what sense? Uh, just uh, some of the things that were, were revealed uh, caught me off guard. And... Uh, just some some very big surprises in it for me. Well, what was it that caught you off guard? Uh, some of some of his insights into uh, what he thought of me as I was growing up. All right, if you don't know who we are, we're the Behavior Panel, and I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement and the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark. I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. Help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military and wrote the number one best-selling book in behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. And I teach people how to do exactly that. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior, put together this number one body language tactics course with Scott, and I spend my time in corporate America. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is an interesting one because we get to see some baseline for a serial killer, a guy who this was his acts were beyond even the craziest serial killers we found. He kept body parts, all kinds of things he'll talk about through here, but it's a good baseline. Very Midwestern, very Milwaukee, slow pauses as he thinks what he's going to say. Make small talk. You're having small talk about the snow with a serial killer. Interesting. We haven't seen that before. Usually the guys want to tell you how grand they are in some way or another. He doesn't. He does a whole lot of down left and down right eye accessing. And when you're ready to get someone to, to, to um, confess, you see a lot of that. It's internal. What does that mean? Internal. What does that mean? I also run into that a lot in corporate America. And the people who do that, I typically find to be kinesthetic learners and people who feel when they're making a decision, feelings are tied up tightly in it. So it's an interesting thing to pay attention to. I've worked with vice presidents of companies who do this a lot, never make eye contact except for to make their point. And it's not that they're doing anything wrong. It's just how their brain works. We do see some concern in his face right in here at uh, I spent all night reading it. And that gives him an area to focus on. That would give me an area to focus on conversation. What about that? What about that caused you concern? Let's talk about it. The ah, uh, when he says ah uh, there, is a little bit longer than in the beginning. And he does a lip retraction in when he said some parts were quite surprising. Raised forehead and internal thought when he was like, well, as his face goes well, that's probably about as close as you get to a wow from a guy who is a Midwestern, very contained guy. I see a rub between him and his father. It's rigid and wooden. Now, given that culture plays a part in that, but I think we'll see a lot more of this as things go. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, really interesting. Like the interviewer on this, because he takes him through the conversational levels really, really fast. It's almost like a fast induction going into um, self-assessment. So let me just explain what he's doing there. We, we, uh, nice nice to see you. And that, that's just phatic communication. Nice to see you. Uh, and the other person is meant to say, yeah, great to see you. And there is that kind of exchange. Uh, like you said, Greg, into the weather. Great fatic, fatic means customary, great customary communication. So they're now talking about the weather. You might go, okay, well, this is really going nowhere, but it starts to escalate pretty quickly. Uh, how are things going? 
Again, this is fatic, this is customary, slow and steady. It's a non-answer, but it's the answer that you should give. You shouldn't be giving too much information at this point. Right, now we're into data. Did you read the book? Yes, so yes or no answer, okay? So that's great, gives a yes answer. But then he's straight into evaluation and emotion, quite a surprise. Okay, so emotion is the surprise piece. Quite a surprise, he's evaluated it on a scale. Well, this is really good because we've got him from, hey, it's snowing out, you know, how are you doing? It's snowing outside, slow and steady, to actually, I've just been quite surprised back there. Okay, so this is really interesting. Now, self-reflection, it caught me off guard. So that's really interesting because the interviewer then comes in on that as he should and goes what is it exactly that caught you off guard about this and we get a revelation that there might be some accuracy to this book because he says the insights uh what he thought of me as a child so i'm going to speculate that there's something in this book that i understand his father has written which dharma believes is actually insightful he thinks it could be very very accurate and accurate about his childhood so great start here because we're into the potentially and of course he could be making stuff up he could be a, a complete liar he could be he could be duping everybody i get that but that escalated pretty quickly and i'm going to say it's absolutely accurate that there is some stuff in that book that is that is true about how dharma sees his childhood Chase, what do you think? I agree. And it, since you're watching this right now, you have met a psychopath before. There is no doubt about it. And in all likelihood, you were in zero danger. So as we say the term psychopath, there's a distinction that I'd like to make at the outset of this. There's a difference between violent psychopath and just a psychopath. And these people do not choose to be this way 99% of the time. So you probably also enjoyed that conversation when you met the psychopath too. I had never seen this video before and you see this head tilt on this entrance. I was walking uh, almost robotically and I didn't know who this guy was that he was walking towards. I thought that's probably his dad or something because of this, you can see the social behavior familiarity in the head tilt before they get close to each other. This is preparation for a hug uh, where Dahmer knows which side his head's going to go during the embrace. The lack of arm movement, he's got this rigid body language, and this is not a psychopath indicator, but it does show here from the, just the outset, the person is more likely to be uncomfortable trying to control or relax themselves, and this bodily control that's exerted here is unconscious, and the rigidity comes from the desire to just exert some kind of control. So he's kind of running human OS. He's running the human operating system right now. So right there on his forehead, we when we are expressive a lot, we express ourselves often, they kind of etch themselves onto our face. My forehead's got little wrinkles on it, but you can't see on Zoom. But there's a lack of conversational interaction and response here. There is His forehead is baby smooth right here which means he's spent a lifetime not performing an eyebrow flash, which we commonly do when we greet people. These are social skills. So just looking at the lack of wrinkles on the face can give us some indicator of who we might be speaking with in this situation. Scott, what do you got? I, I agree with you, especially on the, on the part about the eyebrows. Quite often, someone on the autistic scale uh, will be, w won't use those a whole lot. That's, some, that's something I noticed a while back. So we're dealing with an interesting, I'm not, I, I don't, go into the whole personality stuff. I'm, I'm, I don't do that, but it's a, it's a definitely an interesting personality type we're dealing with here. And when he first comes in, he says, he says, hello, Mr. Phillips, you know, like he's buddies with him or something, or being really respectful. And he seems like this meek and mild kind of guy. And then we see uh, lip compression when he's asked about the book. You know, and he says, oh, it's quite a surprise to me, parts of it. So that, that was, that was kind of interesting that, that sort of containing himself from not maybe not anger, but just containing any emotions he may throw out there at that point. And I think that that probably indicates he probably wasn't pleased with what he read in there for some parts of it. I'm sure some parts of it he liked. Uh, but what I thought was interesting, he didn't go into 
talking about himself and the book and sort of making, you know, the, the grandiose thing you would, you would do if a book was, was about you, if you're a psychopath. So I thought that was really interesting as well. Uh, there are a couple of other things, but nothing big as breath and, and blink rate seem fairly normal. His vocal cadence and tone are, are fairly straight. Uh, like there's not a lot going on and he seems and looks like a, a nice, quiet little person there. Somebody who's very calm and, and um, you wouldn't have much trouble out of at this point. So that's what I got. I can't be good. Yeah. All right. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Sherry. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, Jeff. This one is Phillips. Hi, Mr. Phillips. How are you? Nice to see you. I've been spending the last few days with your folks. Great. Talking about a lot of different things. Hey, you're lucky it came up on a day when there's no snow. It was snowing like crazy all weekend. Is that right? Yeah. How are things going here for you? Uh, slow and steady. Nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary, really. You've read the book? Yes. Yes, I read the book. Uh, uh, my dad sent it to me uh, about last week and uh, spent all night reading it. I was up all night reading it. It was uh, quite a surprise to me, some parts of it. Very In interesting. Sense? In what sense? Uh... Just uh, some of the things that were, were revealed uh, caught me off guard, and uh, just some, some very big surprises in it for me. Well, what was it that caught you off guard? Uh, some, of, some of his insights into uh, what he thought of me as I was growing up. Okay, let's take, all take a deep breath. Your dad comes here to visit about once a month, but I get the impression that that the two of you don't talk a lot about everything that happened, about the crimes in particular. No, we, we don't discuss that because uh, it's been, it's been uh, gone over so thoroughly in the papers and, and the media that uh, uh, there's just really no point in, in going in depth into any in-depth talks about it. We, we talk about uh, our family, uh, home, how things used to be, uh, what uh, prison life is here is like here now and uh, try to keep uh, things as, as light and upbeat as possible is it hard for you to go back and talk about those things uh, no not not the good things in fact it gives me a sense of comfort to talk about uh, the, the few good times there were in the past you say the few good times do you think of your childhood as having been profoundly unhappy? No, not profoundly. My childhood wasn't wasn't uh, filled with any any great tragedies or anything. There were good times and there were bad times. I, th I think it was fairly normal. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, watch for the different breathing patterns in, in the two people who are subjects here. Interesting. It's very easy for us to pay all our attention to Dharma because, you know, he's the, let's just say, celebrity uh, here. But there's another important person in there, which is the father. Clearly, um, you know, a genetic relationship uh, and, and they did live together and spend time together. Uh, Dharma was brought up by his father to some extent. And so, you know, there's a familiar relationship there. So what is familiar about them? Well, their breathing patterns aren't familiar at this point. Dharma, super relaxed. I mean, just super calm. So that's interesting. His father, quite an anxious breathing rate there. Blink rate, totally different. So there feels to me some anxiety in the father that isn't held by the son at this point. Uh, both of them in an interview, so both under some of the same stresses. So does one of them deal with anxiety or stress in a very, very different way than the other? <coughs> quite, quite likely. Um, okay, f a few good times, and there is a, a, a full kind of lip retraction there from Dharma. And the interviewer picks up on that rightly a few good times. So uh, it picks up on that and, and, and digs into this idea of was childhood really a, a, a good one 
Dharma seems indifferent to that question, but I already start to guess that the reason the father is there and the reason the father is writing this book has to be something about looking into that childhood and potentially, I would guess, his responsibility around that. Who is responsible? What is responsible for these acts that have gone on? I'm already thinking, why is the father shown up for this? Why is he written a book? It has to be something about the abdication of some kind of responsibility around this, probably. Now, there's some mirroring, there's potentially some mirroring between the two, and that started to interest me as I see Dharma gesture, and then we get a little one from the father. Are they, they're not in sync with their breathing, but is there some gestural uh, synchronicity there? So I already start to think, by the way, I've not seen this interview before, and, and as usual, have have very little idea about who Dharma is. Um, only just learned now that he ate people. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, I think I maybe saw a film about him once, but I don't remember it very well. Uh, and I know he's a big celebrity in this area. But I already start to think, what are the similarities between the father and son? And what are the differences between the, the, the father and the son? They both grew up somewhat together. They both went from, you know, one went from not a father to a father with that son, and the other, the son went from a child to an adult with that father. What are the, going to be the similarities between them and what are going to be the differences? That's what interests me here. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I wonder, I don't know this to be a fact, but I wonder if there's not a reason he's a little calmer. He may be having some pharmaceuticals in his system concerning mm -hmm. who he is and he's in prison. So, you know, if you've got a guy who has notoriously murdered this many people, do you want to keep, I don't know. I don't know if that's the case or not, but he is awfully calm. You're right. Respiration is different from his father. The mirroring may just be biological mirroring. For example, if I were around my father, you'd say I'm mirroring. And in fact, I just move and act exactly like he did because of the way we're built and all those things, as well as the fact you're raised by him. So there's some of that, but there's an interesting piece. He has leaned almost out of frame to get away from his father for some reason. There's some baggage in this family that's pronounced that we can't see. I read in a secondary article that his father claimed that Dahmer was raped or sexually assaulted by the neighbor boy when he was eight years old. And he thinks it may have had some impact. That may be in the book, don't know. But that creates a whole new dynamic around why Dahmer may have all of these, all this baggage and the father may have it. If you look at Jeffrey, he's playing with a cup when they say, let's all just take a breath. I wonder what's edited out before I found that video, because we watched the, the interview, but there was nothing in there before it that made everybody animated. There must have been some animation for Stone Phillips to say, let's just take a breath. Your, your father is probably, arguably, depending on your relationship and your situation, the first real hardcore authority figure in your life, because they're usually the stop. Wait till your father gets home, especially in the generation he's from, where your father was the person who would deal out corporal punishment if that was the case. So, of course, he's going to have more deference to him, even if he hates him, even if there's baggage, he'll still have that. But his blink rate and his, and Mark, I agree with you, I wrote the same stuff down, his blink rate and his respiration are so calm compared to his dad. Maybe his dad's afraid of how it's perceived because it's the first time he's talked to him. I would say the key words where he said the few good times, People don't use words casually. That means something. That means most of my life was hell. There were a few good times. And then when he said fairly normal, you know, I don't see this again in the entire thing. He pats his feet in many times. But this one, he goes, boom, boom, pitter pat. Ding, ding, something's up. Something's up in his head right there. And if you're interrogating this guy, you want to ask, hey, what's the baggage? Why are you leaning so far away from your friend? What's going on? Those are the kinds of things that we as interrogators see as source leads. And we're going to pick up more of those as we go through this. Scott, what do you got? All right. Now, he's supposed to be close with his dad, but he's sitting, like you were saying, uh, Greg, he's sitting at an angle away from him. And when Stone Phillips says, your dad comes to visit about once a month, he adjusts in his chair. And there's such, such a, a violent back history with his father. I think that comment from Stone Phillips makes him uncomfortable. And after the first question, the father's blink rate skyrockets. And he might be thinking about all, all the horrible things that went on when you know, they had a home and he was married and, and had uh, Jeffrey as a little kid and all that. Um, and he may even feel a little bit guilty about all that. Or he may be afraid that Dahmer's going to say something about him that makes him look bad. You know, that something that would be, I don't know how much worse you can get, it can get than having a son that ate people and all, you know, killed people and ate them. But maybe there's something in there that, that would be even worse, you know, that he did to him or something. Who knows? Uh, and I think it's interesting when he says, um, 
talking about the few good times that were in the past, that gives him a sense of comfort. And after that, we see him even longer lip compression. Now, I think the lip compression at this point is performing two tasks. The number one uh, being an cue that lets us know his stresses or that stresses him. And then number two, it's an adapter. I think we're, quite often we're seeing adapters in this case for him because I think we're actually seeing some emotions on this guy. And that's odd for a psychopath. And for someone to be raised in a, in a situation where you possibly have a narcissistic parent that's hardcore like that, you watch everything you say, you're very protective about everything, and you keep all those things in. You 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 contain all the all those emotions and things. So part of the lip compression may be him trying to keep in those emotions, try not to uh, let something out that he doesn't want that he doesn't want let out. And when he's asked about his childhood, we see a combination of a lip purse and a chin jet. Since there's a lot going on at the house when he's a little kid, that let that suggests that uh, the lip no the lip pursing is a delight is a dislike for somebody he knows or something he heard or something a situation or a person in that in that home or that situation and um i think it's probably the dad so the combination of both of those together the lip person and the chin jut which that usually indicates anger towards someone or that situation i think he might be talking about his dad in this situation so uh yeah, I won't go any further than that for that. But that's what I think is happening there. Then he says his childhood and home are fairly normal. Now, if I was a betting man, I would say that we're seeing body language of someone, again, from a perspective of having a narcissistic parent who is really strict on him. And from what, from all reports and from all I, what all I've seen, I haven't seen a whole lot on this guy either, but I keeps going back to the father doesn't even live with him anymore. It didn't live with him anymore because he was he yelled and was violent. I don't know if he was hitting him. But apparently there's a lot of, of yelling and throwing stuff in the house. So I think there's there's a lot of things that show us he's he's containing his emotions, maybe so he doesn't blow up and do something to his dad or, or whoever's there. Because if you've got somebody that kills people and then eats them, there's a lot going on there from a psychological uh, standpoint. And if you're trying to hold your emotions in, maybe he got to a point where he couldn't hold his emotions in for whatever reason with those people he would do that too so i think maybe that's what the the situation is there a narcissistic um parent father in that situation all right chase what do you got yeah you guys covered a whole lot let's talk about the interviewer then this when when this clip comes back on the screen you're going to see this the interviewer uses elicitation perfectly here okay let's take all take a deep breath your dad comes here to visit about once a month but i get the impression that that the two of you don't talk a lot about everything that happened about the crimes in particular he uses a statement to start getting those topics to come out to start getting the more sensitive stuff to come out and there's a guy named john nolan who wrote a whole book about this called confidential and in this book john my favorite quote of the whole book is the more sensitive information you need the less questions you should be asking and when you guys were talking about this lip retraction, when he was talking about the few good times, let's just turn this into a quick training opportunity. This is typically a need for reassurance. So when, when somebody's doing this, the two best responses are either word repetition or reassurance to make them feel it's okay to move forward. So like something like that makes sense and that's totally normal, or you share a, a story from your own background that's very similar that minimizes the severity of whatever the comment was. So the cup and his hands are both in almost genital protection mode right there where the groin is being covered. If it was a woman, they'd be more likely to cover the uterus area. And your goal, if you are a parent or in sales, if you see lip retraction to do what I just said right there. And if you see genital protection in sales is to get them to change that body language. I want to hand them a pen or a paper to get them to start changing and make their bodies a little bit more open. That's all I got. Cool. This is a guy, just for you guys, this is a guy, I would, if you push this guy, he'd come and bolt it on you in the interrogation mm -hmm. room. I can see it. I've, I know the kind. Seething rage. I agree. Seething rage. Okay, let's take all take a deep breath. Your dad comes here to visit about once a month, but I get the impression that, 
that the two of you don't talk a lot about everything that happened, about the crimes in particular. No, we, we don't discuss that because uh, it's been, it's been uh, gone over so thoroughly in the papers and, and the media that uh, uh, there's just really no point in, in going in depth into any in-depth talks about it. We, we talk about uh, our family, uh, home, how things used to be, uh, what uh, prison life is here, is like here now, and uh, try to keep uh, things as, as light and upbeat as possible. Is it hard for you to go back and talk about those things? Uh, no, not, not the good things. In fact, it gives me a sense of comfort to talk about uh, the, the few good times there were in the past. You say the few good times. Do you think of your childhood as having been profoundly unhappy? No, not profoundly. My childhood wasn't, wasn't uh, filled with any, any great tragedies or anything. There were good times and there were bad times. I, th I think it was fairly normal. One of your dad's biggest questions is when you began to slip away, when you crossed over into this world of obsession or dark fantasy from which you just couldn't return. Can you pinpoint that? Do you, is there a sense for when that really began to happen with you, Jeff? I think it was around <clears throat> age 14 or 15. Started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence uh, intermingled with sex and it just got worse and worse uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it so I didn't I just kept it all inside do you have any sense for where that was coming from no no I've, I've talked with uh, a few psychologists about it they they have their theories, but they don't have any concrete answers either. Do you have a theory? No, not really. I, I don't know where, where it came from. Uh, I probably will never know. But I, I, never, I never dreamed that it would uh, become a reality. That Stone Phillips is a pretty good interviewer. Yeah, he is. You know, it sounds really good. looks really good, too. Yeah. You know? All right. All right, Chase, what do you got? So the interviewer question during this interviewer question, he holds his hand out like he's choking someone and then he motions cutting someone's head off. I don't think it was conscious, but it's certainly pretty clear that to me, he was probably processing that information in his own mind during the question. And this is kind of one of the most honest interviews that we've done as, as far as we can see so far anyway. There's a lot of emotional accessing going on. And as a quick, I'll say it again, pro tip, always place the victim or the emotional person to someone's right. If you're interviewing two people, you want to place the other party to that person's right so that if they do recall some kind of emotion, their eyes are moving towards the person you have them in the room with, and they're getting a visual cue to help with that emotion. So you get more emotion out of the interview. They'll be looking toward that person when they go into emotional recall. That's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, nice. Um, right to the end of that piece. I never dreamed that it would become a reality. So that's wish fulfillment. That is, uh, um, you know, that's a classic of, of, of psychology is that is your fantasy. Your fantasy becomes a reality. And so he's already starting to verbalize that that incredible thing. I mean, imagine it. Imagine it for yourself. Imagine if your fantasies that the world would line up so they actually became reality. This is what has happened to him. And and he's telling us that straight. It's very honest in, in, in many ways. Um, <clears throat> the, the interviewer, which I think you know, so far, really great interviewer minimizes uh, by going crossed over. When did you cross over? <laughs> you know, rather than going, so, well, you know, when did you start eating people? It's like, no, when did you cross over? So it's a beautiful, gentle metaphor for a, a monstrous act. Uh, the father shows disgust 
at that point. And we get a little hand raised from it as, as well. So clearly, the father knows what's being talked about here, what crossing over actually means. He's emotionally activated by that. However, the father then to the story of of this gets very strong eye contact with with the subject. I don't mean they they get eye contact. I mean he's he's targeting um, his son, um, and there's as he as he his son recounts the story. There's no shame. There's no eye blocking from the father. My expectation, if it were my son, I, I understand unconditional love and all that kind of stuff, but but even so, you know, had my son uh, decapitated people and ate them, I might have personally some shame, uh, you know, in front of the TV cameras, and, and maybe a bit of eye blocking, going, God, I can't even, I'm, I just can't visualize this even for myself. I don't want to look at this. The father is very attentive of the son at the moment. Now, at this point, I had no idea about what the father's going to say later on. And, and I start to go, OK, well, how similar are these two? How similar are they? How engaged is actually the father in the idea of fan fantastic violence? Is that actually something that intrigues him and is... is he's very curious about in a way that I think I wouldn't be if I were in that situation. Anyway, interesting. A red flag goes up for me on that, around the father. Uh, we already know there's plenty of red, red flags around the sun. That's, uh, that's a given. Um, uh, do you have a theory? No, not really. Okay, so maybe you do. Maybe you do have a theory. Maybe you do have a theory about that. Um, he says he probably will never know. Oh, so there's a chance. There's a chance you have a theory and there's a chance you might know why you did these things. So at this point in the interview, I'm intrigued by he's not discounting that he has zero idea why this happened and he will never know uh, why it happened. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. When, he st when that first question comes out and he asks him uh, when that odd behavior began, uh, that's when Adamer adjusts in his seat. And I think it's because he's uncomfortable, obviously, but he's preparing his, his answer because I don't think he's really thought about that very much. And we, we're not seeing the facial expressions and classic signs of, of structuring an answer that we always talk about on here. It just seems like it's coming in. The question goes in and he's sort of answering off, off the cuff. Now, when it comes to his uh, vocal tone, his vocal tone, his voice, and his facial expressions, or the lack of facial expressions, so far to me, this does not seem like uh, somebody who is looking for attention. He's not doing things for the camera, you know. He's not using a lot of, of uh, illustrators. He's he's very calm and quiet. His answers are short and to the point, and um, fairly um, simple. Not a whole lot going on with him, and. Um, and not a whole lot going on in his brow either. And I, I just get the feeling this isn't, it's an odd situation when you have someone who's, who's done the horrific things this guy's done, but we're seeing emotions and we're not seeing the classic signs of psychopathy where he wants attention and he's looking for uh, ways to make himself to, you know, to grand, how do you say, in grand eyes, grand eyes himself and make himself look cool. Grand eyes. Yeah. yeah. Okay himself and make himself look cool. We're not seeing any of that. And that's, that's really puts me at a little a crossroads here at this point uh, with what, with what we're dealing with here, even though he's done horrific stuff, we're still seeing a lot of things that say he's not a psychopath up to this point so far. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is an interesting one for me because I said to you guys, I see seething rage. I feel like if I pushed this guy hard enough, he would come unglued in interrogation room. And I think I could push him hard enough with his father sitting right there just by being soft, doing a soft approach. So, Jeffrey, tell me what your father did to you when you were a kid that made you feel this way. And just push him and push him until they get them talking and you start digging and you tear the scab off what's going there. I think there's some rage there. I don't, it feels like there's an awful big gap between these two people. Now, Midwestern folks aren't the huggy type always and that kind of thing, but you don't sit like that to get away from your father at the same time. So there's something going on there. And he's quite comfortable talking about what he did. 
Where we see discomfort is why he did it, how he felt. Watch, pay attention from here on out, because there's a condemning nod and disappointment mouth that pull back in the mouth on both sides at it would become a reality. I think when he starts talking about internal things, about how he feels, he starts to get really uncomfortable. But he's okay telling you he cut somebody up, put them in a box, kept their head as a trophy, because it's known fact. It gives you this feeling that, okay, there's feelings in there. He's okay, and he's not embarrassed to talk about the horrific actions he did, but he may be uncomfortable with talking about why and how he feels. That would be where we dig in and we start to attack him. But let's pay attention to that moving on. I think that's a sign of a heavy introvert, lots of stuff in his background, and we could dig it out. That's all I got. One of your dad's biggest questions is when you began to slip away, when you crossed over into this world of obsession or dark fantasy from which you just couldn't return. Can you pinpoint that? Do you, is there a sense for when that really began to happen with you, Jeff? I think it was around <clears throat> age 14 or 15. Started have, having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence uh, intermingled with sex. And it just got worse and worse. Uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it, so I didn't. I just kept it all inside. Do you have any sense for where that was coming from? No. No, I've, I've talked with uh, a few psychologists about it. They, they have their theories, but they don't have any concrete answers either. Do you have a theory? No, not really. I, I don't know where, where it came from. I probably will never know. But I, I, never, I never dreamed that it would uh, become a reality. What was it, Jeff, that took you over the edge, do you think, and made you take this from the world of fantasy into reality? From uh, 15 on, I, I had this reoccurring fantasy of, uh, of uh, meeting a hitchhiker on the road. And... Uh, of taking him hostage and and doing what I wanted with him. About three years later, I was 18 years old, driving home. Uh, I saw this hitchhiker about a mile from my house. Thought to myself, should I stop and pick him up, or should I just keep on going? Uh, I wish I just keep on kept on going, but I didn't. I turned around, picked him up, and. Uh, that's when, that's when it, the nightmare became a reality. It, it just seemed so bizarre to me that th this obsession that I had been thinking about and wanting, just uh, all, the, all the parts are there and it, they make it possible to make it happen. What happened after you took him to the house? The house was empty. My uh, mother was up in Chippewa Falls with her family and my dad was living in a, in a uh, rented motel about five miles away due to the divorce. And uh, I, I pretty much had the, the place to myself. I was drinking a lot during that time and just, uh, I don't know, looking for something to, uh, some way to find some fulfillment, some, some pleasure. And I acted on my fantasies, and uh, that's where everything went wrong. This All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, it could be the edit, but it looks to me like the father lifts his head in approval to beckon forward this answer around uh, what took you over the edge. So the father's either very interested in wanting to know what takes him over the, the edge, or there may be even approval uh, and wanting to move forward because of the way that question has been framed, because it's not framed as what pushed you over the edge. What's implied is there's something that kind of takes you. There's, a, there's another conscious element that, that draws you over rather than something pushes you against your will. So there's just some interesting wording there that I'm starting to believe at this point 
the father might like because it abdicates him. It already starts to abdicate him somewhat from any responsibility of, of, of being part of this system that might produce this, uh, you know, monster. So um, what's interesting, again, Dharma starts to get quite activated now. We see his legs start to kind of skip up, I think, as you were describing before, uh, Greg, on... Um, uh excitement picked him up okay so picking somebody up uh nightmare became reality uh mother at chippewa falls so there's some ideas there of of everything falling into place for his fantasy to become a reality i mean you know imagine what fantasy you might have and going but what if these events started to just fall into place and your brain's going it's all it's all starting to become true at what point do you then go well what do i need to do to push this forward even more or is it just is life just gonna you know play cards in front of me to make my fantasy a reality uh he says drinking a lot and then uh and there's something he doesn't say there but there's contempt on his face at that point looking for something to um to find fulfillment okay there's two gaps there i would want to know what is the what is not being fulfilled what does he need what is what is the gap there that he's having to do this act to fulfill because there is some story there about it's it's, it's violence and sexuality mixed together and it's the fulfillment of that but i think there's a possibility that there are some gaps in his life gaps in his childhood potentially and there's some wish fulfillment that needs to be acted on there that you know if the mother is away uh if the mother is away what is the wish fulfillment that you might act on if the mother's not there to watch this and and the cards got played in front of you anyway uh really interesting i want to know what is that gap that he feels contempt for and I wonder if it's sitting next to him. I don't know, but I wonder if it is. Uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, great stuff. And let's just go aside from behavior or nonverbal behavior. In this one clip alone, he refers to it as a nightmare and then later a fantasy. And I think this should illustrate to you how important it is uh, to pay attention to this. How people use descriptors and language to describe their actions is a big deal. When he says the house was empty, there's small digital flexion on the dad. That's the one thing I'll just talk about here with this. So for me, I think this probably a point of personal regret, uh, something around the divorce or leaving him alone, whatever it is. This would trigger for me a later conversational question about the dad at, later in the interview. And if you have kids, three things to do really quick. Number one. What am I doing to make them more confident, even if you have to force them to do it? What am I doing to make them feel significant in their life? And number three, identify where your kid's dopamine is coming from and modify it if necessary. Ensure you're guiding them by mapping out where their dopamine is coming from. And that's going to be a game changer, huge game changer. Greg? Yeah, a couple of things. I think his whole thing that he shows with the digital flexion there, Chase, may not be about leaving his kid at home because he's 18, I think he says. I think it's more about he's out living in a hotel because he just went through a divorce. So there's probably something there. But we know for sure there's some stimulus for him there. With Jeffrey Dahmer, we see ultra, some kind of ultra containment. You see a deep swallow, a dry mouth, and then look at him, how far he's gotten away from his father. Mark, I think progressively, I think the stimulus may be sitting in the chair next to him may be part of the problem. Remember, I told you that his father has later said that he was sexually abused at eight by the neighbor, but he still denied it up until his death. Don't know if that, that says there's something hidden and some shame and a whole lot of something going on there. And who knows what went on in the family after that, all kinds of craziness can occur. He, he is apprehensive. Here we get to this discomfort. Remember, he was he's happy to tell you about body parts and all that, but he's apprehensive as he's telling this hitchhiker story and he makes quick fishing eye contact, which we haven't seen. He's been okay with good eye contact, but he's doing the eye contact break and away and break and away as if he knows what's normal and that this isn't. Then he starts to talk like a text instead of like sentence structure. Listen to his sentence structure change. He gets into, he doesn't use a full sentence. He goes into phrases. 
that tells you that he's trying to get through telling you how this happened. And then his legs start that whole adapting thing, Mark. I'm not sure whether that's out of excitement for what he actually did or whether it's I got to get through this, but something changes in his brain. And then he goes and lets out a long breath and goes, um, and his cadence shifts and he starts to slowly walk through it as he's talking about the mechanics of what happened. I think he knows he's going to be judged for it and that everybody watching is going to judge him and there's discomfort in it. And then you see a minor tongue jut at acted out fantasies and that's where everything went wrong. I, I, this, Scott, I'm like you, Bundy, Gacy, they would have never felt nothing, no mm -hmm. shame, nothing about telling you. They said, yeah, I killed him. Bash just hit him with a stick. Oh yeah, I buried him under the house. Oh yeah, this guy's not that. It's weird mm -hmm. because we typically associate monsters with psychopaths. Sometimes monsters are just monsters. Wow. Oh, I forgot you. What you got, Scott? <laughs> <laughs> Turn about fair play, right? <laughs> I almost said Scott? something, but I did. And with that, Scott Rouse. <laughs> Scott yeah. Rouse. The body on his Franken. With that, the body on his Franken. Scott Rouse. What do you got? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Okay, well, we see that uh, at the top of the when you asked that question initially, that lip com that lip compression. I think again, that's he's, I think we're looking at two things here: we're looking at an adapter as well as him trying to keep himself contained. So I, uh, that's really interesting. This is this guy's really freaking me out because he's he's doing a bunch of stuff that says he's one thing, but he's doing he's not doing anything that, that confirms that. You can look at that and go, oh, I know what that is, but you don't have anything to confirm it, which is all of us have a soapbox we stand on and talk about that all the time, about absolutes and those types of things. So his behavior is one thing, but the way he is, his, everything else, the outcome of some of his behaviors are just say one thing, but everything else says something completely different. And I agree with you, Greg, it's, we're dealing with a lot of rage here that he's that he's keeping in. Um, and then he adjusts again in his seat when or during that same question, he does that little seat adjustment. And uh, he know, but he knows it's going to be in, uncomfortable answering the question. And he gets a little worked up here is because like you were saying, Mark, his leg jiggles a little bit, his hands, he's using those as, as adapters as well. And especially after he, after he says, that's when the nightmare became a reality. That's when his leg jiggles again. And he adapts with that coffee cup, like you guys were talking about earlier. And the rest of his answer remains quiet and, uh, and calm. And he, and he's not he's not showing things he's, he should be showing that are congruent with what he's done. It's freaking me out. What was it, Jeff, that took you over the edge? Do you think, and made you take this from the world of fantasy into reality? From uh, 15 on, I, I had this reoccurring fantasy of, uh, of uh, meeting a hitchhiker on the road and uh, of taking him hostage and, and doing what I wanted with him. About three years later, I was 18 years old, driving home, uh, I saw this hitchhiker about a mile from my house thought to myself, should I stop and pick him up or should I just keep on going? Uh, I wish I just keep on, kept on going, but I didn't. I turned around, picked him up, and uh, that's when, that's when it, the nightmare became a reality. It, it just seemed so bizarre to me that th this obsession that I had been thinking about and wanting just uh, all the all the parts are there, and they, they make it possible to make it happen. What happened after you took him to the house? The house was empty. My uh, mother was up in Chippewa Falls with her family, and my dad was living in a, in a uh, rented motel about five miles away due to the divorce. And uh, I, I pretty much had the, the place to myself. I was drinking a lot during that time. And just, uh, I don't know, looking for something to, uh, some way to find some fulfillment, some, some pleasure. And I acted on my fantasies, and uh, that's where everything went wrong. This, this was the summer of 1978 when you took your first victim. Right. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like uh, it had control of my life from there on in. The second occurrence was 1984, roughly. And I met this guy at one of the uh, 
bars, downtown Milwaukee bars. We went back to the hotel. Just planning on uh, getting drunk, I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him unconscious. And I uh, was just going to spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, uh, my forearms were bruised and his chest was, was bruised and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed. And uh, I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. And that's when it, when it all started again. And once it started again, you found it impossible to stop. Right, that, that's when the, the obsession went into full swing. Man, I'm digging the stone Phelps, man. He's asking, he's oh, asking good. questions he's and shutting up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, mm -hmm. it, watch, wow. him, watch him in lots of interviews. He's good. He's good. Yeah, I like that guy. All right, Greg, what do you got? I don't have a lot on this one. What I will tell you is listen to the passive language. Listen to the alcohol. There are agents of blame in here that are not him, and you can, can't miss them. Alcohol has shown up. He's mentioned it more than one time. Alcohol was something else. I don't remember. Everything's in passive voice, the second occurrence. And he avoids talking about picking somebody up in a gay bar. There, I've read that he had issues about his sexuality and never actually came out and said he was gay. But whatever his driver, he's distancing, lots of distancing language from this thing he's done. And we all know he's done it, he's admitting it, but he's still using that distancing language. I don't think of folks like Bundy and Gacy <laughs> and Ramirez and those guys, none of them seem to care. They've just told you, yeah, I did this and I did that and I buried him in the backyard and I cut him up. And... But this guy's using distancing language, which makes it odd for me. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, and severe aberrant behavior is almost always at the intersection of shame and fantasy coming together when those two things are together. There's a ton of distancing language here, but it's it's almost a dissociative language. Uh, while he's talking about a dissociative incident, which he was actually dissociated from the, the incident, I think it's honest. He's comfortable with describing the severity of the situation, sensory details congruent with the truthful recall of events, and I think he genuinely doesn't recall, and I th he was probably blacked out, drunk. And I think that there's a lot going on there. There's probably just the, there's a shame that's preventing some of it from coming out. The shame is the only thing that's really hiding information here. That's my opinion there. Scott, what do you got? All right. I, again, I think this is odd because of the, the gravity of the violence that must have gone on with him doing all this. And he's explaining it. Uh, with with no motion and, and no illustrators, his voice, his cadence and tone stay the same. Everything's, but that still makes me feel like he's containing all that. That's what gives. That's why I think you're you're right, Greg. I think just right under that man, there's a there's an explosion under there that that could happen any second. But he's just short to the point with all of his his, his answers to the question, and it's it's a uh, this gets more fascinating. I think as we go along. Um, because with all that violence that happened, he's like you were saying, Greg, he's not approaching this as Bundy or some of these others would. It just it just doesn't fit in the in the psychopath um, section yet. Not just yet. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement. It, it is pretty extraordinary. It is a is something that we haven't really seen, I think, before. Uh, so he says it just seemed like it had control of my life. So there's this idea of it. So there is this abdication of responsibility to, to something else that is that is not particularly associated with him. But he says it seemed like. So he's vacillating between it was me and it wasn't me. But again, I don't see a lot of deception around that. I don't see him, you know, coming up with an idea to blame. You know, we've seen in other in other cases of, of monstrous acts, you know, I'm going to blame uh, pornography and I'm going to blame this, I'm going to blame society. There's no blame, but there's this idea of it seemed like it. That's kind of, that's kind of it. And he's so calm when he's saying that. So it feels to me very, very honest and truthful about this it, but at the same time seemed like it, like which one is it? Can you have both at the same time? You maybe can have both at the same time. I have no memory of beating him to death, but then his eyes do move at 
at that point, I think for approval. So is there some memory? Is there truly no memory? Is there a little bit of memory? Again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, listen, I just then, after hearing all of that, I just look next to him and I just go, what's that dad doing there? What's he doing there? What are you, I just want to go. So why have you come here? Like, what's this really about? That that for me is the, is 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 where the interesting interview is. I think it's like, what are you doing here? Um, again, I go back to this: is it about the abdication of responsibility? Is he enjoying this idea of 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 it? Uh, because again, if it's about it, he's totally uh, non responsible for this. I'm not. Sh- and then what comes up in my mind is something that was said before by Dharma in one of the previous videos, where he talks about the divorce, not their divorce, or, you know, mum and dad were getting divorced, the divorce. So I'm just thinking there must, there could be something about that instability of mum and dad not being together and most likely some other violent acts, um, potentially sexually violent acts from the father. I just don't know. I don't don't know enough about the story. Um, That, uh, but, but, but huge instability, I imagine, in Dharma's childhood there, which I think the father has maybe shown up to abdicate himself from. There, that's all I got on that one. I think um, I got figured out why the guy, why the uh, father is there. Has anybody yeah. else figured out why? Censorship. Book sales? It's the book. It's book the book. Sales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, the, above and beyond the book sales, yeah. Yeah, but no, that's what, because you know his his publicity people like we'll get him in we'll get him to talk to jeffrey you know it's like one phone call and they do the phone call like the old school i'll call him up and say jeffrey let's we'll get him you know that's what it is it's about the book the book company did it yeah you know mark one of the points you bring up about him using the it i think the it keeps him from having to talk about how he feels i think it's a distancing tool for him yeah yeah. because he feels really uncomfortable when he talks about what's going on in here Yeah. yeah That's was it Stephen good. King who came? Who, is it is is he came, was it his book It? Is that yeah? Is that yeah, Stephen King? Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. The idea of it. Hmm. Look at Mark going into the symbolism, man. You're going deep, dude. <laughs> Go get it. Well, it's the thing that can't be named, isn't it? That even even <laughs> Stephen King can't name. You can't put a name on it, but it'll it'll kill somebody like a gorilla would okay. kill somebody. I was I was going to write a book called Don't Mess With Them, They Kill Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly did. This was the summer of 1978 when you took your first victim. Right. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like uh, it had control of my life from there on in. The second occurrence was 1984, roughly. And I met this guy at one of the... Uh, bars, downtown Milwaukee bars. We went back to the hotel. Just planning on uh, getting drunk, I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him unconscious. And I was just going to spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, uh, my forearms were bruised and his chest was was bruised and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed. And uh, I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. And that's when it, when it all started again. And once it started again, you found it impossible to stop. Right, that, that's when the, the obsession went into full swing. Did you ever tell yourself, I have to stop this? I must stop doing this? Yes. When it was going on? After, after the second time, it, it seemed like the compulsion to do it was too strong, and I, I didn't even try to stop it after that. But uh, after, before the second time, things had been building up gradually, uh, going to bookstores, going to uh, the bars, the gay bars, uh, bath clubs, when that, did, when that wasn't enough, uh, buying sleeping pills and, and using it on uh, various guys in the bath clubs, it just escalated slowly but surely. And uh, after the second time, which was uh, not planned, 
uh, it was out of control. It felt like it was out of control. All right, Chase, what do you got? I'm just going to cover one thing here. Right at the end when he's saying it's out of control, there's some strong lip retraction. This is precisely where the word repetition would seriously come in handy. This would give him an opening to talk about it more, essentially giving the reassurance that he's needing here. We see this, the lips going in and he says out of control, all the interviewer would need to do here. And the interviewer is great. All he would need to do is say out of control. And he would just keep going, just repeat that phrase back and they will keep going. So Mark, what do you got? Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting area, isn't it? Not planned out of control felt like it was out of control gets to a stage where he didn't try to stop it so it vacillates for me between well hang on was it truly out of control or did it feel like it was out of control and you just thought you didn't want to stop it at this point and i think he's been very honest throughout it's at this point that i'm i'm not quite sure whether he's he's being fully deceptive but I think there's more to get out of him about really how out of control he was, how conscious he was. Was there some plan? You know, or did the cards just keep falling like the first stack, like the hitchhiker turns up, you turn round, you give him a ride, it's just things fall into place and the wish is fulfilled. Or do you now start to have to plan, like planning to go to a bookshop? planning to go to a, uh, a bath club, planning to, you know, what point are you, you know, honestly, really, truly, you know, planning to buy sleeping pills, planning to... Impulse buy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, so escalated slowly, but surely. Oh, okay. So there was a certainty that it would escalate. So, so again, it's, it's, and, and then there's some, um, um, there's some lip grooming, I think, after that, slowly but surely. So I think he's trying to mediate this, I, this idea of it potentially, I think, was planned and he wants that to look as good as possible. I don't think in his mind he truly believes it, it was just it took over and he's unconscious and nothing. I'm, I'm saying there may, may have been events that were like that, or certainly he's made them feel like that. But I think there's more conscious effort than he is letting on. It's, it's, it's starting to feel a little more deceptive for me. But I'm willing to have my mind changed on, on, on that. Scott, what, do you, what have you got? What do you think? All right, I agree with you. But I think we're, we're seeing that the, the uh, lip compression, I think, again, that's an adapter because it happens so soon after the question. And all the questions, it happens fairly quickly. So I think he's prepping to hold his, hold his um, his feelings in, but at the same time, uh, Chase, I agree with you on that as well. I, th I think this cat's holding a lot of stuff in. This is where he sees him, the the largest illustrator so far is when he goes up into the passion plane. Mark, with I didn't his, teach with him. his <laughs> do what? I didn't teach him. I didn't trade him. I hate you all. <laughs> uh, he goes up in the passion plane, and and he's and he's, and he's um, illustrating from there. And I'm under the impression that no. A scratch is an adapter as well. So I, I think that's something where he's just, you know, needs to expend some energy there. And lip compression, again, is more of an adapter than anything else. Uh, his cadence and tone, everything seems, stays the same. His volume goes up just a little bit as he gets a little bit uh, worked up in that. Um, but he's coming straight on with, with his answers. It's, there's, he's not hedging anything he's not pausing he's not waiting to think he's not making these big grandiose things you know he's just it's looking really interesting this whole thing greg what do you got yeah guys i'm on the same things one of the, the nose scratch i agree is an adapter he's uncomfortable he does something but the two big ones the two biggies here are both source leads the first one is not planned it's a change in word pattern he emphasizes it much harder than most of his other word patterns. If you go back and listen, not planned. And he makes hard eye contact. He's leading, he's telling you something and you need to ask him. If I'm interrogating this person, I say, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean not planned? Because it's out of character for everything else he said. Then he's got that contained emotion. I agree with you, Scott. When he does that, it may be an adapter. 
But in this case, I'm sure it is contained emotion and that lip grip at, I felt out of control. I would give him an opportunity to talk about that. So you could likely get him to open up with all the right questions. I would start off by saying, what could somebody Sorry. have done, Jeff, that would have stopped you? What, what could somebody have done that would have stopped this, Jeff? Help, help me understand why you said not planned. Was that haphazard? And then I would, okay, it, it was haphazard, but you went and bought sleeping pills and, and, and. and then I would push him until that rage came to the surface and get what's really in there. Because I do think when he's talking about internal things, again, he's masking and he is going to use deception or whatever it takes to get his way. But those three things are really the keys here. And those source leads that not planned, that contained emotion that felt like out of control. And then mark yours where he's talking about, but it, it was going to happen regardless. I think you just poke on him a little bit and you get a lot more information. Did you ever tell yourself, I have to stop this? I must stop doing this? Yes. When it was going on? After, after the second time, it, it seemed like the compulsion to do it was too strong, and I, I didn't even try to stop it after that. But uh, after, before the second time, things had been building up gradually, uh, going to bookstores, going to uh, the bars, the gay bars, uh, bath clubs. When that, did, when that wasn't enough, uh, buying sleeping pills and, and using it on uh, various guys in the bath clubs, it just escalated slowly but surely. And uh, after the second time, which was uh, not planned, uh, it was out of control. It felt like it was out of control. Was it the killing that excited you, or is it what happened after the killing? No, the, the killing was just a means to an end. That, that was the least set, uh, satisfactory part. I didn't enjoy doing that. That's why I tried to... Uh, create uh, living zombies with uh, uretic acid in the, in the drill uh, but it, it never worked no the killing wasn't wasn't the objective I just wanted to have the person under my complete control not having to to consider their wishes being able to keep them there as long as I wanted uh, it's not easy to say that but that's that's what the motive was where did that need for control come from do you have any idea I don't know maybe I felt uh, I had no control as a, as a child or a young adult and uh, that got mixed in with my sexuality and I ended up doing what I did was my way of, of feeling in in complete control at least for that situation creating my own little world where I had the final say, uh, finding the best looking guy that I could and uh, having total mastery over him for as long as I wanted. Lust played a big part of it, controlling lust. That, uh, that was the motive right there. All right, Greg, what do you got? It's a lot of powerful and horrible stuff in there. I'll leave to you guys. I'll just say this. Look at that lean. Look how far out that guy has gotten. He's, he's moving out of the chair almost. His back is twisted. And when he says, at no control as a child or younger adult, watch him illustrate in his father's direction. Boop, boop, boop. Something's going on. This time, Scott, when he's using his purse lips, I think they're illustrators making his point. So yeah. I think he's so contained in his face that we see illustrators, we see control of emotion, and we see adapters all in his face because he's so contained in the way he moves. Now, while he might be not, we may decide he's not a psychopath, he's at least the kind of guy you could look at in an ordinary setting and say, that looks like a bad thing to hang out with. I'm not going to have any involvement with that guy. But apparently enough people did that I, it was in the teens of numbers of people to kill. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, it seemed this whole thing seems a little bit boring if you're not into this kind of thing. But it's I think it's a really fascinating look at somebody who's done horrific things and watching them uh, listening to them and watch them describe what's happened, you know, uh, the, where they sound like a turtle or a fish or something. If you could make one of those things, get one of those things to talk, not like a, a Bundy or some of the other people we've watched and, and, and talked about, but just a plain delivery. It's almost robotic. It's almost monotone as he does that. Um, it, at the same time, it, it doesn't have that really 
eerie, dark film on it like most of the others do, but it's still there. Like you said, Greg, you can still spot it from across the room. We go, I don't know, let's, we would all go, check this guy out. Let's watch this guy for a minute. We definitely keep our eyes on him because he would be acting, even though he would be normal looking, what he's not doing is what makes him so odd. So I think it's, it's a very interesting, um, from that standpoint, say it's the things he's not doing and the things we're not seeing and hearing that separates him from, I don't want to say normal psychopath, but from someone that falls under the, the psychopathy label at that point. Um, he's certainly like said, not glib. He's certainly no, not glib. That's for sure. That's for <laughs> sure. But I'm, I'm, I'm looking hard for something, just one thing, well, more than one, that tells me this guy's got is is besides the eating people and killing people and eating them that says he's a psychopath he's not showing uh, the classic signs of it so i think that's odd at this point chase what do you got yeah i agree with you guys and covered a lot uh, that i had in my notes here but this i think this behavior stems from something that i teach in a lot of my courses on influence and persuasion and there's four things that can make somebody compliant to another human and I think everything in the world stems from these four things. And I call it the FATE model. It spells out F-A-T-E, which is focus, authority, tribe, and emotion. In that order. In that order. And I think as a kid, he likely failed to get these responses from these people in order. He had the focus of no one. He failed to have any authority in many places in his life. He was largely excluded from social circles. Family fell apart, so the tribe disappeared. And he garnered little to no emotional reaction from people. And this developed, I think, into an emotional behavior pattern for him. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, interesting. The father uh, shows, I think, contempt, which is just the side of his mouth, just pinging up there, uh, asymmetrical gesture there. Uh, contempt or disdain on on the kill being a means to an end. He also eye blocks on that and self-soothes with his little finger on the chair. We've We've... We've experienced his reaction to Dharma talking about killings, but never as a means to an end of something else. And the father has this contempt uh, reaction there, which I think is really interesting. So what is it that the father might know or doesn't like about whatever end, whatever wish fulfillment Dharma was actually trying to get that killing was a, a, a journey towards? Dharma's saying is that wasn't the end product. There was another end product. It's just killing is part of that thing that I'm trying to get done. What is the wish being fulfilled there? I think the father knows something about that and has contempt for that, for that end wish or may have contempt for his son in that maybe the father felt that he was a better controller of those kinds of internal feelings. Maybe there's a similarity between the two, I'm thinking at this point, and one feels that they controlled it and the other weren't able to control it. But anyway, we do get into this control element here. The means to the end was the, having the final say, controlling everything, big illustrators on that getting mixed in with the sexuality. <clears throat> there's talks about, about lust, but the emphasis is on controlling not not the lust aspect. So I think Dharma uh, feels that it might be helpful to wrap it up with the idea of sexuality. But I think the real point about this is control. Uh, and and that's so. So again, what's that gap that he's cut that he's trying to control there that the father may have some understanding of exactly what that loss or that gap is now now thinking about, um, you know, personality types that we've got here. Uh, there's only one person in the room that has written a book <laughs> about their son uh, chopping off heads and eating people. Now, I'm a father. Uh, if my son I doubt it's ever going to happen. Uh, we were to chop off people's heads and 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 um, you know eat people. I've written a bunch of books, but I think the last thing I'd think about is go. Oh, I think there's a book in that. I think I think there's a. Even if, as clearly has happened, you know, a, a, a publishing house came to me and went, Mark. Uh, you know, here's, here's a few hundred thousand. I think you got a book there. I might go, no, I don't really want to touch that, mate. I don't, no, not really. 
Uh, and then I go, well, you know, you do like to be in the public eye. You do like being on YouTube and stuff like that. And, and you know, people knowing who you are. And I think, yeah, you know, I'm, you know, on the, on the spectrum of attention seeking. Yeah, I, you know, I would be on the, on the more outgoing. But around my son killing people and eating them, I don't need any attention around that. Thanks. There's only one person in the room that has gone in that direction. I find that interesting. Was it the killing that excited you? Or is it what happened after the killing? No, the, the killing was just a means to an end. That, that was the least set, uh, satisfactory part. I didn't enjoy doing that. That's why I tried to uh, create uh, living zombies with uh, uretic acid in the, in the drill. Uh, but it, it never worked. No, the killing wasn't, wasn't the objective. I just wanted to have the person under my complete control not having to to consider their wishes being able to keep them there as long as i wanted uh, it's not easy to say that but that's that's what the motive was where did that need for control come from do you have any idea i don't know maybe i felt uh, i had no control as a, as a child or young adult and uh, that got mixed in with my sexuality and I ended up doing what I did was my way of, of feeling in, in complete control, at least for that situation, creating my own little world where I had the final say, uh, finding the best looking guy that I could and uh, having total mastery over him for as long as I wanted. Lust played a big part of it, controlling lust. That, uh, that was the motive right there. Your dad has wondered about all kinds of things, from the medication that your mom was on during her pregnancy, to the fact that you were exposed to violent arguments in the home from an early age and continuing, to the possibility that he might have passed on some genetic propensity for obsession or violent behavior. Does any of that ring true to you? I can see why he'd wonder about those things, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses because I didn't feel accountable to anybody. I didn't feel that I had to, to uh, face what I had done ever. And uh, so you, you have, there comes a point where a person has to, has to be accountable for what he's done. Can't go, can't go around making excuses, uh, blaming other people or other things. So I, I alone am the one who's responsible for what's happened. Let me ask, when did you first feel that everyone is accountable for their actions well thanks to you for for sending uh, that uh, creation science uh, material because I always I always believe the uh, the lie that uh, evolution is truth the theory of evolution is truth that we all just came from uh, the slime and uh, when we when we died you know that was it there was nothing so it, the whole theory cheapens life and uh, started reading books about how that show how evolution is, is just a complete lie. There's, there's, no, there's no basis in science to, uh, to uphold it. And I've come to, since come to believe that, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true creator of uh, the heavens and the earth. It just didn't just happen. And uh, I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that I, as, long, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to him. Growing up, did you feel that you were accountable to your dad or to your mom as the authority yes, figure I did. in the house? Yes, I did. I mean, they, they didn't let me uh, run wild. They, were, they disciplined me. And uh, so I felt accountable to them. But afterwards, after I left the home, that's, that's when I... Uh, started wanting to uh, sort of create my own little world where I could be the one who had the complete control, where I didn't have to uh, bow to anyone else's demands, and uh, I just took it way too far. All right, uh, Chase, what do you got? So I don't have a whole lot here. There's a lot of distancing language when he's saying a person. That's the big shift I want you to listen to. He's not talking about himself anymore. He's socializing this. A person. 
And if this is genuine, and it certainly appears to me to be, this is incredibly rare to see a person who's committed an act like this and not uh, redirecting every spotlight onto themselves. And the lack of emotion, kind of distancing language, there's a lack of pressure here, a little bit applied by the interviewer, makes a little heavier barrier for us to determine whether it's sincere or not. But in my opinion, it absolutely is. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. I think we see some sincere body language here. The interesting part for me, if you want to know where a lot of his formative issues are, is watch his eyes narrow as the topic violent arguing comes up. When you say violent arguing in the home, his eyes narrow after he drops down to the right and does a rapid head nod. Hmm. Hmm. There's a formative issue for him. His lips purse more tightly. I believe that is at the core of a lot of his issues and he uses specific words and words matter. I could be the one with absolute control. I could be the one. That says somebody had absolute control, so he wanted some absolute control. Then he goes to the, the ultimate high ground for all excuses, and this is a story he came to tell. I did a lot of wrong things. I did a lot of this, but God will be my savior and take care of me. Now, his father can't leave that alone. This tells you there's some narcissism somewhere in there. Well, who, who introduced you to your Lord and Savior? Come on. I mean, this is your child that has gone wrong that whatever you did somewhere along the way might have played into it. We don't know, or maybe it didn't, but it's your child. And your child is trying to take the high ground. You go, yeah, 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 wait a minute. Give me my credit and where credit's due. I, I told you all about God. That's the weirdest thing you've ever seen. I have right here, this guy might be a closet narcissist because that's a weird approach. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, could well be. And, and violent as well at the same time. So, uh, you know, what an extraordinary situation to... to, to uh, grow up in where you know quite probability here is he's seeing is is in arguments his dad beat up his mum potentially his mum beat up his dad that's sp maybe spilling over to him maybe spilling into sexual violence as well so it's a very very unstable environment that is being described uh, here however you know um Dharma takes full responsibility. We, we hear at the start that he goes, well, you know, I, I, I didn't take any responsibility for what is happening. And, and instantly I went, oh, OK, there, there it is. Maybe we have something psychopathic there. But that gets transmuted into actually in the end of it all, thinking about it, I've now taken full responsibility. That's, that's not anything usual around psychopathy. Um, now, what's interesting is, yeah, you're right, Greg, like the dad jumps on that one because we've gone, hey, it's, um, uh, uh, it's not the home. Um, uh, it's, it's, it, you know, it's not uh, genetics. It's something that my dad passed down to me. Uh, it really is, he goes, it's my responsibility. And I now understand that I have to take that responsibility. Dad jumps in on that and like goes, you know, just like you said, Greg, who's helped you come to that <laughs> approved um, uh, viewpoint? Uh, that's that's quite extraordinary that he does, because we haven't heard from him before, have we? He's been pretty silent. He's done very little. He's just sat there. So there's a piece of nonverbal. Why are you now overtly behaving at this particular point? Why do you need to take this particular point? What's so important here? And I think it is that, number one, that abdication of responsibility and then going, but I am responsible for him taking the approved and, uh, and godly view of this. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm good, uh, I'm, I'm pure and uh, by the book, it's, it's excellent. Scott, what do you got on this one? I agree with you. And I think it's with his dad, it's that situation like Anthony Jeselnik. He's a comedian. He tells us he has a bit about when something horrible happens, everybody on Facebook and Instagram, you know, gets in and goes, my thoughts and prayers are with whatever it is. And he says, all they're saying is, don't forget about me. Don't forget <laughs> about me during all this. Don't forget. So that's at this point, I think he's don't forget about me. And at, at this point, because and I think it might be, we might be de dealing, well, no, it, well, I don't think it's, it's something genetic. I, I can't tell. This thing's freaking me out so bad uh, with what we're seeing. But that's where he jumps in, Mark. That's where he gets his, his attention. You're right, you're, you're right, Greg. 
where he's nowhere else to hear about anything, but right there when it comes up and he can get in there and get his shot in. Oh, here's where I helped you. Here's what I did good. And he goes right to religion, the big one. Everybody's down with that, you know, most everybody. But I did that. That's that's his shot. That's his, that's his that's his narcissistic shot there that he saw and he could take and, and feel OK about it. Back to the question. This is the, this is his longest answer so far. And as he goes along, this is the first time we see him really get worked up as he's going along with this. This is where he starts showing more emotion than he has up to this point with all these. And from a psychological uh, standpoint, I think this is this is fascinating because like you were saying earlier, Greg, you could push this guy enough and it, it wouldn't take a whole lot. You know, it would take a couple, what, take seven minutes probably to push him enough. If you got him in the box and got him cornered and started pushing him on something, he'd explode on you. And I think right here, we're actually seeing some of that leak out. That's why I think we're at the, the core of the, the problem here, which is his dad. And I think that's the I think that's what we're looking at there. That's why he gets so worked up. And of course, dad jumps right in. So I think that's that's fascinating. Your dad has wondered about all kinds of things, from the medication that your mom was on during her pregnancy, to the fact that you were exposed to violent arguments in the home from an early age and continuing, to the possibility that he might have passed on some genetic propensity for obsession or violent behavior. Does any of that ring true to you? I can see why he'd wonder about those things, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, they're all excuses because I didn't feel accountable to anybody. I didn't feel that I had to to uh, face what I had done ever. And uh, so you, you have there comes a point where a person has to has to be accountable for what he's done. can't go can't go around making excuses, uh, blaming other people or other things. So I, I alone am the one who's responsible for what's happened. Let me ask, when did you first feel that, that everyone is accountable for their actions? Well, thanks to you for, for sending uh, that uh, creation science uh, material. Because I always, I always believe the, uh, the lie that uh, evolution is truth, the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from uh, the slime and uh, when, we, when we died, you know, that was it. There was nothing. So it, the whole theory cheapens life and uh, started reading books about how, that show how evolution is, is just a complete lie. There's, there's, no, there's no basis in science to, uh, to uphold it. And I've come to, since come to believe that uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the true creator of uh, the heavens and the earth. It just didn't just happen. And uh, I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior. And I believe that I, as, long, as well as everyone else, will be accountable to him. Growing up, did you feel that you were accountable to your dad or to your mom as the authority yes, figure I did. in the house? Yes, I did. I mean, they, they didn't let me uh, run wild. They were. They disciplined me, and uh, so I felt accountable to them. But afterwards, after I left the home, that's that's when I uh, started wanting to uh, sort of create my own little world where I could be the one who had the complete control, where I didn't have to uh, bow to anyone else's demands, and uh, I just took it way too far. Is it still there, Jeff? Does it ever go away? In part, no, it never, it never completely goes away. I'll uh, probably have to live with it for the rest of my life. I wish it would go away. I wish I, there was some way to completely get rid of, of the, the compulsive thoughts, the feelings. Uh, it's not nearly so bad now that there, there's no avenues to, to actually act on it. But uh, no, it never seems to go completely away. So the thoughts still come to you? Sometimes, yeah. Are you different, Jeff, in terms of wh how you think back on all of this? I would hope I'm different. Uh, I'm, glad that I, I'm glad that I'm in a position now where I don't feel the compulsion to do these things. I'm glad that it's over. Any words I say to the, to the victim's families are, are just going to seem trite and empty. Uh, I, I don't know how to express 
the regret, the sorrow. Um, that I feel for what I've done for their for their sons. Uh, I can't find the right words. So, all right, see you later, Dale. Okay. After the interview at the prison, Dahmer casually showed us something a little unsettling. Just a point of interest that that's the type of box. This, the, this is the type of box? Exactly. He wanted us to know that box looked strikingly like the one his father had found, the one no Jeffrey box. had used to hide body parts. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, he's quicker to respond this time. He's showing some passion. He's still very Midwestern when he says, in part, it never goes away. And if you watch those lip retractions, Chase always talks about this, these lip retractions where he needs approval as he's walking through this, those are characteristic for him. He also does a lot of that. Remember, I started this whole thing off by talking about he looks down right, down left, down right, down left, and kinesthetic. That's just who he is. This is, however, the most passionate and detailed we have seen him in any of the things we looked at. Listen to his words, listen to what he says, but also look how far away from his father he is. There's a real lip compression and a retraction at the same time, pulling his lips back. It sometimes th do the feelings come back when he says yes. Then he shifts gears to something. I stopped, I ran construction for a lot of years and I removed these words from my construction manager's vocabulary, hope, feel, and believe. Those are church words. Those have no place in factual conversation because I don't care how you feel. I don't care what, what you think matters. What you know matters. What you can see matters. Those are ways to escape away from any kind of responsibility. You see it all the time in construction. When he says, I am glad I'm constrained, it looks genuine and his face kind of pushes to the center to show disgust. His musculature and structure doesn't show real pronounced disgust, but you can see it still. And then my favorite of the whole thing, when he hugs his father, if that's not not disdain, I don't know what the hell it is. You can't miss it. That's why I think there's seething rage in this guy. And then the final broken toy is, hey, that's where I used to keep my friends in that box. It's pretty creepy. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, amazing. Um, interviewer joining on in on the it ideal. Uh, again, I think that's just a softening. It's just to, to help him tell the story. I would hope I'm different. I've got the same underlined here. Uh, Greg, yeah, I'm not going into a room with somebody who hopes their behavior is going to be different. <laughs> I want to know you for sure uh, that you know it's it's different. Uh, he says, I don't know how to express the regret and 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 the sorrow. So again, you know, alarm bells ring for me because because not being able to feel regret is is something we might experience with somebody who's uh, on the uh, in, uh, who's who's being put down as psychopathic? Um, so you know, is that is that a possibility? Well, another possibility is he's not been taught how to feel those things. We we learn how to. We all have emotions, whether we we like them or not. Unless you're you, you're remiss to have a, the part of your neurology that's going to better produce some or all of those emotions. Um, but but how we're trained to express them, when to express them, that's to do with our upbringing, that's to do with the groups that we're, we're part of. So it may be a sense of uh, nurture there that means he doesn't quite know how to express those things. Also, there might be a neurotype that is uh, more interested in things and not feelings. And, and you know, that, that neurotype is, is a part from psychopathy. So you wouldn't want to mistake one for the other. There's a great group of people out there who are super interested in things and have a little bit of a problem going, what are these feeling things that are, that are going on here? And then after that, he does get into one of his things, which is, oh, look, a box, a box like my box that I used to keep severed heads and genitals uh, in. Now, what's great there is the father puts his hand on the back shoulder there, a suppressive gesture, and you'll see the disgust and disdain come across the son's uh, mouth at that suppressive, governing, controlling uh, gesture as the, as the dad tries to hold him back or hold him down and go, don't talk about the box, son. Don't, let's not go down. I thought we'd dealt with all of that and you know now you know, I thought we'd sold a whole bunch of books and and I'd made myself out to be a good guy and now you're doing the whole story about me wanting to look inside the box at the 
I mean, that's an interesting, no, I won't go into that, but that's interesting stuff. You know, you go round to your son's house and it's like you manage to track down the box that's in the cupboard in his bedroom and you want to have a look into it. It's like there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff going. There's too much curiosity going on there for my liking. Uh, anyway, uh, Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree. And there's one line in here where he says, I would hope so. And I, we talk about this, if you're a subscriber, you, you hear us mention this on occasion. This is the reverse. This is him being comfortable with uncertainty, which I think is an indicator of truthfulness because he's not trying to sell you on the idea that, yeah, I'm, I'm completely fixed. And I think this is a one of the, if not the most genuine serial killer interviews that's out there. Uh, there's a there's some dissociative language, but I don't think he's trying to pitch anything to us. I think that's how he views it himself. And he's just being honest about it. And anybody thinking that uh, one thing makes a person a violent psychopath is ridiculous. It's a cumulative effect. If you're born with a gene that makes you more likely to get cancer and then you eat 60 pounds of Cheetos every day your whole life, that it's a, there's an accumulation there. So some genetic factors may play a role in likelihood. And that's all we're really looking at is likelihood. So everything in, throughout a kid's life and throughout uh, an, even an infant is increasing or decreasing likelihood of developing some kind of psychopathy. And when I say kind of psychopathy, human beings are not math equations and we're not formulas. So like saying the DSM is a great book to diagnose mental disorders, it's not a Bible and it's not a math reference manual. Some people are just screwed up and there's all kinds of stuff going on. And I think that's what we're seeing. <laughs> Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. This, uh, this was the most emotion he showed so far. And there, I think there was a lot of it there. I think he does feel bad about that. We don't see that with, with psychopaths. We, we've seen him pretend to feel that way, but we haven't seen all the little things that come along with that from a body language perspective that tells us that that's most likely true. And I, I think you nailed it there, Chase. There's something's up here. The, he, his attempt to keep everything in and keep everything tight and not show anybody anything goes back to him being alone all the time, I think, at his house. And I think of that fussing going on when he's a little kid and all that. I think that's what did it. I think that's what's he got in those little those odd fantasies and stuff happening. And there's nobody to talk to, not a brother or sister, I don't think, to sort of snap him out of that and go, dude, that's weird. You shouldn't be you shouldn't. You know, that's weird. Nobody to tell him that kind of thing. So, and I'm, I'm sure it happens more often than not that a child is raised by itself and they have nobody to bounce stuff off of and, and they may seem a little bit different than the rest of, uh, of their group. But in this case, I think he was he's, he must have seen violence from a very young age. And then that's when is the other things that happen to you when you when you grow up as a child. And when you start getting older and you reach puberty and all those things, those things must have triggered that in him somehow because he's not showing the things that he should be showing of uh, being a psychopath other than killing and eating people. That's what, that's, what's so weird about this. You know, everybody else would say, dude, and everybody else on here, we're going to catch so much flack from people saying, Hey, you know, I know, I know he's a psychopath, but I tell you, I, I thought he, he probably was too until I watched this. Cause I didn't watch it. I don't like watching these things. They, you know, we must watch all this stuff, Greg. <laughs> yeah, no, this you is know, a job. Who, who likes doing that? <laughs> you can be a psychopath without ticking this oh, yeah. magical list. We can just right. say say the word psychopath, but it doesn't fit this magical perfect list, and the list is not perfect. So right, right, well, and well, that's a uh, Robert Harris yeah. list. Yes, uh, yeah. Still, uh, the, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we're gonna make sure we get him in there. But yeah. yeah, so I agree with you. Yeah, and some people go along; they never know they are one. That they never know they're not psychopath. Violent. A lot of yeah, yeah they're nonviolent. They just live their life because they've been in a situation where people loved them, took care of them. They weren't uh, exposed to violence or anything like that, or, or a lot of that. But I think in this case, there was so much going on. He just totally went inside and started to find things that pleased him or the things that he liked. And those, those triggers from him growing up and when he hit his, his, um, hit puberty and, all, and, and became aware of those kind of things. I think that's how that got mixed in with those things at that, at that, section of his life and i think that's what we're seeing it's horrible it's horrible all that that happened is it still there jim does it ever go away in part no it never it never completely goes away 
I'll uh, probably have to live with it for the rest of my life. I wish it would go away. I wish I, there was some way to completely get rid of, of the, the compulsive thoughts, the feelings. Uh, it's not nearly so bad now that there, there's no avenues to, to actually act on it. But uh, no, it never seems to go completely away. So the thoughts still come to you? Sometimes, yeah. Are you different, Jeff, in terms of how you think back on all of this? I would hope I'm different. Uh, I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I'm in a position now where I don't feel the compulsion to do these things. I'm glad that it's over. Any words I say to the to the victims' families are are just going to seem trite and empty. Uh, I I don't know how to express the regret, the sorrow. Um, that I feel for what I've done for their for their sons. Uh, I can't find the right words. All right, see you later, Dan. Okay. After the interview at the prison, Dahmer casually showed us something a little unsettling. Just a point of interest. That that's the type of box. This is the, this is the type of box. Exactly. He wanted us to know that box looked strikingly like the one his father had found, the one Jeffrey had used to hide body parts. Thank you, Jeff. All right, uh, so why don't we throw around the room and sort of wrap it, even though we sort of just did. Let's wrap it up in 30 seconds or less and see what we think, or take 30 seconds longer if you want. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I, I don't like Dharma. I think I like the father even less, though. But <laughs> that's, just, that's just me. Uh, Chase, what do you think? Yeah, so psychopath is just an idea. It's not necessarily a medical term. And when somebody says they're pleading insanity, the word insane is a legal term and not a medical or psychological term it's a legal standard so it's another it's a, those are concept buckets of particular behavior we just have a person who's severely screwed up we don't need to put a huge label on it uh but this is just one for the books because this is such a, a departure from from normal when it comes to these types of offenders greg yeah all humans are a complex chemical soup Whatever you get exposed to when you're two and four and nine and 15 and 50 and 60 changes who you are. I mean, Jung said two people interacting are like reagents are never the same. So every one of those interactions is going to matter. <clears throat> if you don't take care of your kids, if you don't pay attention to them when they start doing something aberrant and you're not paying attention, it gets rewarded. And by the way, rewards not always, hey, Johnny, good job. It might be something darker than that. So we don't know what causes these people. If we did, we could go and say, hey, stop doing that. And you won't make this. And there's biology, there's nurture, there's everything that happens after that. So who knows? But this is a really interesting one to me because I'd never watched him because it is such a creepy story. But when you do watch him, it's also a very interesting story. Scott, what do you got? I think this might be my favorite so far of the shows we've done because we're seeing how much we, we enjoy dealing with psychopaths and going, ah, here's why a person is a psychopath. And here's the things. And, and so look out for that. This is one of those cases, man, this guy doesn't show those. However, he is, it, it, he, he's got that one thing going wrong with him over there. Wow. So I think, I think that's fascinating. I, I, I think it's, it's probably my favorite. We're seeing one thing, but we're saying, and everybody's going to think he is. And over here it says, nah, not showing anything he shows he is. But now his dad, that makes me wonder how bad it got at home. Because for someone... You're right, Mark. That whole, I'm going to write a book about all that. Yeah, I'll write a book and call him <laughs> yeah. up and we'll go on. We'll have him on the show. It's all about the dad, but it didn't end up being about the dad. That's why he's trying to jump in and make it about himself. I, I think, wow. I think that's where the, that there was a movie about it. I haven't seen that, but I think that's where the movie would be about, about the dad at this point. And there's another one coming out on Netflix here in a couple of months that's, voy that's all taped interviews with Dahmer. So this would be a good one for you. Excellent. All right, fellas, I think this was a good one, and uh, we'll see you next time. Yeah. See you. So what do you got? Hey, it's Dr. Phil here. Please subscribe to the Behavior Panel. I'll be sad and 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 I'